Well, good morning. I am uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know, I was scheduled to be here once before, um, something Sean has become very familiar with, um, since he was the one that on short notice filled in for me, because I wound up with influenza the day before that I was supposed to be here. I had a fever of over 105, and I did not get out of bed for about two days. So um, I am, I'm grateful that I get to be here. I love every time I get the opportunity to bring God's word to God's people. So thank you for having me. Um, I love this. So before we get going just a little bit, and we will be in the Bible, John. Uh, we will be in the Bible, I promise. Um, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles, we're going to be in the book of James. We'll be in chapter 1, and we'll be focusing mainly on verses 2 through 4, although we will read 1 also just to build some context into what we're talking about this morning. Um, but before we get there, I want to tell you all a little bit about who I am, because most of you probably have no idea who I am, and that is fine. Um, probably safer that way, honestly. Um, my name is Jared Allen. I am from Oregon. Some of you probably want to throw things at me for that, but please don't. Um, I was born and raised there, graduated in 2006. Um, I was saved when I was 12 years old. I, was, I grew up in the church. Uh, as a matter of fact, I usually sat right about where you guys are on the second row, because just like here, nobody sits on the front row. It's just something you don't do. So, I sat right about there, so boys, watch out. You might wind up being preachers someday. But I was saved as 12 years old, and I believe, I truly believe that before God, I was justified. I was saved. I had no doubts about if I was to die at any point, I would be in the presence of God. However, it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I really began to take my faith seriously, until I really started to understand what it was to be sanctified, what it was to become more and more like Christ. As I studied his word, as I surrounded myself with God's people, as I prayed that he would change me, it wasn't until I was in my 20s that God started to place a call on my life. I remember I was 22 years old. I had been married to my lovely wife, Stephanie, who was unable to be with us this morning. Um, but, oh, by the way, for those of you who know my wife, please don't judge me unfairly. My wife is entirely too good for me. <laughs> Not in a sense that you think more of or less of me because of her, but you will probably think too much of me if you know my wife. Um, not only did I hit a home run with that, it was Game 7 of the World Series, bottom of the ninth, walk-off Grand Slam. Um, <laughs> She's entirely too good for me. But I was 22 years old. I'd been married for about a year. I was attending a men's Bible study. And I came home, and I remember telling my wife that I kind of think maybe God's calling me to, to be a pastor. And she looks at me and says, Jared, I don't want to be a preacher's wife. <laughs> and I said, I get it. No, no, so we wrestled with this for years we went back and forth about what God was calling us to do, how he was calling us to respond to who he is, and what that meant for us, and how we were supposed to move forward in that calling. And we wrestled with it for, oh, about six years or so. And we continued. I was, I was Jonah saying, no, God, I don't want to go there. No, God, I don't want to do that. No, I just, that's not what I want to do. And then I was about 28, and we'd had this conversation on and off, and my brother called me. He had just graduated college, and he says, Hey, Jared, um, I know you had talked about going to seminary a while back. I didn't know if you were still thinking about that, because I'm going to go get my master's, and I think you should go get a degree, too. I said, Well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I could. And I kind of tried, honestly, this is the truth. I tried to brush him off. I said, I don't know, we're pretty set on where we're at right now. We're pretty comfortable where we're at right now. I think we're, we're pretty well set long term. I think we know what we're going, going to do. But I said, I'll talk to Stephanie. I'll talk to her. And I had used her as the excuse not to do this for years. And I went home, and this is pretty much how our conversation went. It was, hey, Steph, um, Brian said he was going to go back to school. He said he thought I should go too. She says, all right, when and where are we going? Wow! What is this? Who are you? Obviously, there was more to the conversation than that, but that was basically what happened. So, we, uh, long story short, we said, okay, we started looking around. We decided that uh, we would pick up our family and we would move to Fort Worth, Texas. 
where I studied at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary for a little over a year. Um, I love the school, I love the professors, the education was amazing. I never in a million years dreamed that I would read anything by Aristotle or Plato, but uh, they had you read philosophy to build up to the early church and see how the scriptures, how, how God used that as a vehicle to drive the scripture home. It was amazing. As you read Paul's words, I would encourage you, as you read the words, especially of Paul, to read him not just as a disciple of Christ, which he is, not just as an apostle, but also think about him as a philosopher. Because the way he asks questions of everything, the way he starts saying, yeah, okay, okay, that's true, so now what about this? And he drives the conversation deeper and deeper and deeper, using a philosophical method. And he asks questions of everything, leaving nothing, so that you can drive it back to the basis to build upon the truth. And I, I loved that, and I enjoyed it so much. And then, of course, we found out we were going to have our third child. Um, we have three now. We have Molly Ann, who is four years old. We have Campbell, who is two and a half. And we have Enoch, who is just over five months old. But we found out we were going to have our third child, and we decided, one, we wanted to be closer to family for that. But two, we were back here, and we saw a brokenness in people that we'd known for years. People that didn't know Christ, that we had known for years, and our hearts were broken for them. So we decided that we would move back this direction. Our original intent was to stop at Kansas City and not move all the way back, but God had other plans. We wound up back, and uh, two weeks ago, I accepted a position as a pastor of the First Baptist Church in Oregon. Not what I had in mind originally. But we're excited to see how God works through us, and we are doing our best to follow Him, even when it's not exactly according to our plans. So that is a little bit about me. And I want you to know that because, because there are some, some things that every time I start reading God's Word, every time I start thinking about how to approach a sermon... I start with this presupposition, this, this thing that comes into it already assumed. I assume that Scripture is inerrant. I assume that the Bible is God's Word. I go into every time, every time I sit down to prepare a sermon, I know that the Bible is God's inspired Word, and how dare I deviate from that. So I was glad you said that about having your Bible with you. I was really excited that you said that, because that fit perfect with what I wanted to talk about. So I walk into all of it, so we will, we will dig into the text. Before we do, though, I would like to pray for us, and we'll get going. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, you are, you are good. You are, and it's a simple truth, Lord, that you are good. And not good in a way that we think of our favorite food, God. You are good in a way that it is the very nature of who you are. And Lord, we thank you for being good to us so that we might, as the song sang, we might know you. We might know you because you bore our cross, because you paid our debt. Lord, thank you for, for being good to us. Lord, as we read your word this morning, I would ask that you would, that you would open our hearts to what it is that you are speaking through James and just help us to rightly understand what it is that you are saying through him. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how many of you have siblings? Let me start with that. Just about everybody. That's kind of what I assumed. Kind of what I assumed. I have three brothers, I have no sisters, and I have, everybody tells me they feel bad for my mom for having all boys. I think she's lucky, but, uh, I mean, you got perfection. No, I, I, am, I am kidding, I am just joking. Um, no, I grew up with three brothers, and, and I'm sure you have noticed, at some point or another, you have noticed that either a sibling, or maybe it's not just a sibling, maybe it's a close friend, somebody who you are close to, that grew up near you, who, who you came up alongside, did similar things with. Somebody, sometimes these people just don't seem to grow up, right? We've all said that. We've all looked at somebody and said, they just need to grow up, right? We all know those people. Now, maybe you're not thinking of anybody in particular, and you just can't come up with anybody. It may be you. Might be. <laughs> But 
they all, everybody kind of matures. Everybody grows differently. It's not like all at once, everybody at the time you are 13, you are this maturity level. By the time you're 20, you are this maturity level. By the time you're 50, you're this maturity level. No, no, no. Everybody matures differently, right? But these people who just won't grow up, they always have a few things in common. It seems like that either they are constantly in this state of struggle, always in this state of difficulty where nothing seems to go their way. They're always wrestling with something that just they just can't get past. Or the other option is maybe this person is one of those people who usually is he, they're usually OK. They're all right. But then when something something does happen. Something bad happens. Somebody in their family passes away or, or something along those lines happens. They are just devastated to the point where they can't pick themselves up off the floor. They, can't, they, they turn to drugs or alcohol or whatever it happens to be. They just can't get out of their own way. And we say, man, that person needs to grow up. And I think to some extent, that's kind of what James has in mind as he writes this book. See, the majority of James, the main focus of James is, is spiritual maturity. It is growing in maturity and becoming more like Christ as you do, and specifically in hardship. It is growing in that way as we become more and more like Christ. See, James writes his letter to people who are assumed to have some knowledge of the Scriptures already. And I told you I wanted to address James. Well, let's just go ahead and read it real quick. James chapter 1, verse 1 says, James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. He's writing this letter to the twelve tribes. These are Jewish people. These are people who are assumed to know God and have some knowledge of his scriptures. They are assumed to have some, I dare say, religious knowledge. So, to equate that to today, these are people who grew up in church. These are people who, who came, they heard the scriptures read, they heard a preacher preach, they heard these things. They had some idea, at least some idea of who God was beforehand. They already had that knowledge, but James writes this letter to them to urge them forward, not to stay as a baby Christian, but to grow, to mature. That is the, that is the main focus of this letter. And some people, some people have tried to take the words of James and pit them against Paul. See, Paul says, Paul says that you are saved by grace through faith, not by works, so that no man can boast. Okay? And that's all, that is entirely true. However, James here, in this letter, seems to focus more on works. As a matter of fact, at one point, he, he actually says, you say you're saved by faith, I say I'm saved by works. Well, show me your faith without works. The faith is dead. They don't, they're not really pitted against each other. It's actually a unison. Every time that you see faith in the scriptures, it is always followed by works. Always. There is never an exception. If somebody comes to faith in God, it will be followed by works. James and Paul are not in conflict. They are in agreement. James is just trying to drive it to maturity. See, they had different audiences. Paul... Paul was largely writing to Gentile people. He was writing to unbelievers. He's telling them, this is how you come to know Christ. James is writing his letter to people who are assumed to have knowledge of God and driving them further. It is a different audience. So, a good example of this maturity as people grow, I think a good example of this is Peter. I think Peter works really well here. And as you think of Peter... You might think of the, narr the gospel narrative as Jesus is arrested, and, and Jesus already warned Peter. He says, you're going to deny me three times, right? And he does. He ends up denying him three times. As things become really difficult for Peter, he, he, did, he turns and says, no, no, I don't know him. I'm not his disciple. No, 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 no that's not me. You're, you've got the wrong guy. He denies Christ. However, later, as you read into the book of Acts, you see that he's going out and he's preaching powerfully. He is not denying his faith anymore. Instead, he's standing in the face of persecution. He's standing here and preaching the gospel so that people come to know Christ. Peter matures. He grows. So as we dig into this text today, I want you to ask yourselves, which Peter are you? Which one are you? Are you the one that when things start to get difficult in your faith, as as People start to question, why do you believe this? Why do you believe that? Are you the one that turns and says, oh, I don't know that I really do believe that? 
Or are you the one that stands firm in your faith and proclaims Jesus boldly? Are you living like you are unashamed of the gospel? Or perhaps maybe you're just living like everybody else? I want you to think about those today as, as, we, as we study this passage, as we dig into this text. So let's read this text and we'll, we'll get going. Starting in verse 2, since so we've read 1, James 1 2 says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. So as we read these words, as we pull it apart, and we'll pull it apart almost word by word. Because I believe what Paul writes to Timothy and that all of Scripture, all of Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. I believe that. And because of that, I don't want to miss a word. So, my intention today is for after we are done here, after we're done studying this passage, that we will go out the doors, and as you go out to your jobs, as you go out to your workplace, as you go out to your families, whatever you do when you leave here, that you would go and you would be unashamed of Jesus. That you would go and move boldly like Peter does and tell people about Christ. That's my purpose for this message today. And to do that here in James 1, 2 through 4, we're gonna, I want you to see, specifically, I want you to see Two prerequisites for living a rewarding Christian life. There are two, at least at least two, prerequisites for living a rewarding Christian life. And I say rewarding Christian life because there in verse 1 it says, Consider it great joy, my brothers and sisters. If we are living a joyful life, it's a rewarding life. I want you to live a life joyfully. And in order to do that, you have to do these two things. First, you have to live a rewarding Christian life, you must see persecution as a benefit. Rewarding Christian life, you must see persecution as a benefit. Look at the second half of verse 2 there. It says, whenever you experience various trials. The first thing I want you to notice here is it doesn't say, if you experience various trials. It doesn't say that. The word is whenever it's going to happen. It is not an option. Either, either you have these trials or you, well, maybe you won't. No, no, no. It says when you have these trials. This isn't an option. If you are living a Christian life, if you are living a life that pursues Christ and His righteousness, you will experience trials. Most of you are thinking, boy, this sounds terrible. You are the worst preacher ever. I'm not going to be motivated to do a thing. Don't worry, we're getting there. Hang with me. Persecution will come to Christians. Trials will come to Christians. In 2 Timothy 3.12, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It is not optional. If you don't have any kind of struggle, if you don't have any kind of challenges that stand between you and your faith in Christ, you might need to start thinking about what your faith lies in. Or who your faith lies in. You will have difficulty. You will experience persecution. You will experience trials. And specifically here, whenever he says that you will experience various trials, what, what exactly does he mean by trials? Well, the word, the word actually suggests a testing or a temptation. It is a testing of your faith. You will experience testing of your faith. That's going to happen. There are going to be things that challenge you. That as you say, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, I'm a disciple of Jesus. As you say that to people, as you live that, it's, you are going to be challenged. You are going to have somebody that's going to ask you hard questions. And you may not always have the answers. And you may start to doubt what you believe. Peter did it. All of, all of, the, all of the twelve did this. They thought Jesus was going to be one thing. They thought he was going to come into Jerusalem and he was going to be the king. He was going to be this great, this great king who sat on the throne in Jerusalem and ruled over the nations. And they had, a, they had a now an immediacy to it. They didn't think down the road or even in a spiritual sense where he's coming to redeem his people. They thought it was going to be a new government. And as Jesus is arrested and he says, I'm going to die, they start to think, wait a minute. Is that right? Their faith was tested. 
They had questions that were hard to answer. They had to live through this. The second thing I want you to notice is that the reason this is a benefit is because, because of the testing. See, again, most of you probably don't think of tests as fun, right? I, uh, going back to school, boy, I was, I was intimidated. I'm 30 years old. I thought, man, I haven't, taken, I haven't taken an exam like this in, I don't know, over 10 years. I can't sit down and take a test. Are you kidding me? That's the way I thought of this. But the testing is there for a reason. As, as we take a test, it shows us, one, what we do know, and two, what we don't know. As our faith is being tested, it is going to show us what we are doing well, what we are, how we are strong in our faith, the things that we know in the areas that maybe we don't need to focus quite as much of our study on. And then it's going to show us our weaknesses, the areas, the things that we got wrong. It's going to show us, okay, hey, I, I had a hard time with this particular thing. Maybe I need to focus more here. I need to improve myself here. I need to better myself here because this test has revealed that I'm not as strong there as I need to be. So testing is a positive. It is intended for our benefit. It's intended to bring about what is genuine or approved or the pure part in us. It is intended to show us our own hearts. This testing is there for our benefit. The second thing I want you to see about this testing, here in verse 3, it says, Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. This testing is going to build endurance. As you start to see where you're weak, as you start to see what you need work on, or even what you're strong with, it is going to help you to produce endurance so that you can move forward, so that you can be moving forward in strength. And I think about it like this. In high school, I ran track. And unfortunately, I got because I was the coach's son, I got pitted with the long distance races. I ran the mile and the two mile, and the worst meets, I ran the mile, the two mile, the four by eight, and the 800. Those four mile meets were awful. My legs were jello at the end of the day. I just felt sick the whole time. It was terrible. But I never got out of bed one day and just said, hey, I'm going to go run four miles today. I can do this, no problem. I bet many of you are that way. I, how many of you would just get out of bed today and go run five miles? Nobody's raising a hand. Yeah, I didn't think so. No, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? Whew sounds like work. No, no, no. You build up to it. It's not something you roll out of bed and you go do. No, no, no. You build up to it. You work up to it. This testing is intended to produce perseverance. As you are preparing for that race, it's going to be short intervals. It's going to be a test here. Okay, now I'm going to push it to, to two miles today. Ne tomorrow I'll push it to two and a half. Then next week I'll push it up to three. And I'll start, I'll start building and building and building until I am prepared to run that race. And in the same way, this testing is intended to produce perseverance so that we can carry on, so that we have the strength for what's needed. The, the endurance here, the perseverance here that this, that this scripture is talking about is the same, same thing that's referred to whenever it's talking about the perseverance of the martyrs. And now many of us, especially in our first world context, we're not going to be called to, to live our life until we are burned at the stake. We're probably never going to experience that. There are people in this world who do that. Most of us probably won't ever be faced with that. I think that's safe to say. However, we still need to build this endurance as we become more and more like Christ, as our faith is tested, so that we will be able to stand in whatever difficulty is coming. There are hardships, there are challenges that come our way, and we need to continue to build endurance so that we are prepared for whatever it is that God calls us to. The testing is for our benefit, benefit so that we will have that endurance, that perseverance. So, to live a rewarding Christian life, you must see this persecution as a benefit. The second thing I want you to see is that to live a rewarding Christian life, you must stand firm in hardship. You must stand firm in hardship. Again, this production of perseverance is an ongoing process. Look at verse 4. It says, And let endurance have its full effect. Let it have its full effect. As you as you begin to build perseverance, as you begin to stand in these testings, as you begin to become more and more like Christ, you will be sanctified. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm in a lot of theological circles. We talk about the process of sanctification a lot, right? 
See, I believe that whenever we are saved, whenever you are saved by God, there is an immediate justification before God. You are immediately saved. You are justified before God. It is you, Your debt has been paid. You are redeemed. However, there is an ongoing aspect to that salvation. There is an ongoing aspect to that salvation that we become more and more like Christ as we live and as we pursue godliness. There is this ongoing process that we become more and more like him as we are sanctified, as we, as we do these works that James is, is encouraging us to, that we can only do through Christ. We have to allow it to finish its work. We have to go onward. It says, let it have its full effect. The word here indicates work or labor. It's not, not something that's easy. It's work. It's a struggle. There is going to be difficulty. It's going to be hard. We have to let endurance have its full effect. The word that was used for work or labor or, or perseverance here indicates, well, it was often used in an agricultural sense. I'd be willing to bet most of you have some experience with agriculture. Mostly because, well, we live in northwest Missouri, so everybody has some hand in ag somewhere, in some way. And this word was often used in agriculture, and for that reason, you probably understand this. It's never-ending. It is constant. There is always the next thing that needs to be done. Once you are done with one season, you are preparing for the next season and the next season and the next season. And I would be willing to bet that most of you who farm never stood back, looked at your field and said, yeah, I'm done with this field for the next 10 years. Right? It doesn't happen. It's ongoing. It is continuous. It is an ongoing process. The work that has to be done, the perseverance that has to be built, is an ongoing process. It is never ending. We have to allow these tests to produce in us godliness, this perseverance. Second, I want you to note that perseverance produces strong Christians. The second half of verse 4. Let's just read verse 4 again. It says, And let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete Lacking nothing. Perseverance produces strong Christians. First thing there, strong Christians are mature and complete. See, I love this. This is exciting. This is exciting stuff. I never knew that... And i got to be careful here, because I don't want you to think that you have to go out and you have to learn another language to be able to study the Bible. I don't believe that to be true. However, through studying Greek, I have, I have noticed a few things. The word here that, that indicates mature is perfect or full grown. And it's the same word that Jesus uses as he's hanging on the cross and he says, It is finished. It is complete. It is done. It is over. It is perfect. It is mature. See, as we persevere in our faith and we become more and more like Christ, we become more and more perfect. We become more and more like the one who bore God's image in Jesus. We become more and more like Him as we stand in these hardships, as we stand in the testings of our faith, as we stand in these things. We become more like Him and we become more perfect. Strong Christians become perfect in that they become more and more like Christ. We have to move beyond the immature things of our faith into strength that comes by living a life of godliness. Strong Christians are mature and complete. They are perfected by Christ. We have to move forward to be more like Him. Second, strong Christians are fulfilled. The last words here say, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. I'll tell you what, I have, I have lacked an awful lot in my life. <laughs> an awful lot. Seems like I come up short of an awful lot. But God says here that Christians, as we persevere, as we become more like Christ, as we pursue this godliness, and we are standing firm in the difficult times of life, we are standing firm in our faith here. We lack nothing. We have everything that we need. As we persevere, we become more like Christ and that we have everything that we need. 
So, this is the part that I always call the so what moment. It's what I like to call it, all right? We know what the scripture says. Okay, so what? So now what? That's my, this is my favorite part. Favorite part of every sermon. Because now I get to ask you fun questions like, are you standing firm in these hardships? Because this is the point where we have to reflect on ourselves. We have to start asking ourselves, as we know what the scriptures teach, we know that they say that we have to stand firm in hardship. We know that they say that these, these persecutions, these trials, these temptations are going to come our way. It's going to happen. So now what do we do about that? Well, I get to ask you, are you standing firm in them? Or frankly, are you allowing Satan to have his way? That sounds harsh, I know, but that's the reality. It's one or the other. Well, maybe the better question is, are you experiencing hardships at all? The Bible says whenever you experience various trials, not if. Are you experiencing hardships at all? If not, you probably need to start asking some serious questions. But if you are experiencing them, how are you responding to them? Are you Peter who, who fades away and denies Christ? Or are you Peter that goes out and preaches the gospel boldly? I told you earlier that my purpose, that my, my intention today was to see you move out the doors and to preach the gospel boldly in the face of adversity. And I challenge you to do that by one, seeing persecution as a benefit, and two, standing firm in the trials and temptations. In order to do those two things, there are three things you've got to do that have to be done, absolutely have to be done. And in preparing this, I almost thought this was too much of a, of a Sunday school answer. You know what I mean? For those of you who grew up in Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. First, you've got to read your Bible. It's pretty simple, right? It sounds easy. You have to read your Bible. You have to know what God says. I mentioned earlier that I believe that they are the very words of God. They are, they are God's inspired word to us. And if we believe that and we want to stand firm in the trials and temptations, if we want to stand firm as hardship comes our way, we have got to know what the Bible says, what it teaches, and how it teaches it. And I'm not just talking about opening and say, okay, well, this, over the next year I'm going to read from Genesis to Revelation. I'm talking about digging in, seeing what does this mean, applying it to your life, actually understanding it. I want you to read your Bible. Know your Bible. Second thing you have to do is you have to pray. I told you these are Sunday school answers. You've got to read your Bible and you've got to pray, Right? Man, you've got to pray. I'm not just talking about light prayer, though. See, we, we have a tendency to say, well, yeah, I whispered this prayer on my way to work this morning. I'm good for the day. No, no, no. I'm talking about being a people of prayer. See, whenever we understand what prayer really is, whenever we understand that the book, book, the book of Hebrews teaches that we have access to the very throne room of God, the one that spoke everything into being. When we understand that we have access to the throne room of God and we can bring our requests before the one who spoke everything into being, that breathed life into us, when we understand that, we become a people of prayer because there is power in prayer. I heard somebody say once, a prayerful people is a powerful people. And that's very true. We've got to pray if we are going to stand firm in hardship and see persecution as a benefit. And the third thing, this is a little less Sunday school, but still a little bit there. You have to surround yourself with other believers. I truly believe that. You have to surround yourself with other believers. Now, again, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we become that group of people that just shuts themselves off from everybody who doesn't know Christ, because that's kind of the opposite of what Jesus says, as he says, go and make disciples of all nations. No, no, no. What I'm suggesting is, while we do that, that is important. Yes, we also set aside time to meet with other Christians. That might sound a little silly since I'm standing in a church full of Christians, right? I'm talking about more than just church, though. For me, this meant, meant calling up a good friend of mine who I, I respect a great deal, who has a knowledge of the scriptures that I, I admire. He knows God's word better than I, I probably ever will. I call him up and I have, I have lunch with him every so often. And our conversation always turns back to what our, our faith, and it turns back to, to how God is working through us, or how God is speaking to us through the scriptures and what they teach. We talk about specific doctrines. We actually dig into those things, and it is important to meet with other believers and allow iron to sharpen iron, to become more like Christ as we meet with these people. And if we aren't doing that, we're going to have a hard time when the difficult times come. It becomes far more difficult when you try to do it by yourself. It's important that we surround ourselves with other believers. 
I told you earlier that uh, my brothers and I, we all matured differently. Um, <laughs> I don't know how, how harsh I want to be to my brothers, but uh, we all matured differently, and that was largely because we faced different circumstances. You know, one of us, one of us, we lived in our parents' basement until we were entirely too old. One of us lived like a college freshman until we were well into our 30s, and uh, I still can't grow a beard, so we have clearly matured differently. <laughs> But the biggest part of the reason that we matured differently is because we faced different circumstances. There were things that they struggled with that I never did. There were things that I struggled with that they never did. And because of that, we matured differently. Our circumstances affect the way that we mature. And it's the same thing here. As we experience testing and temptation, not everybody experiences the same testing which is why we have different callings. We're not all called to the same work. But we have to understand these trials and temptations, this hardship that we have to stand in is shaping us for a work that God has in mind for us, something that He is wanting to do through people. See, God works any way He wants, but one of the most common ways He works is through people, right? We see it time and time again through Scripture. He uses this person to bring this about. God is shaping you through your circumstances. So how will you allow the hardships to affect you? Will you sink back in immaturity like Paul did early in his narrative? Or will you go boldly? Will you sink into immaturity and not, not try to drive yourself forward in your faith? Live in your parents' spiritual basement? Or will you persevere? Will you grow on to maturity. That is my question for you today. As we close, I want to end with this. Today, today is the day to start living a rewarding Christian life. Some of you may or may not know Christ. I assume many of you are Christians. I assume many of you know Christ. However, I'm sure there are some here who do not have a personal relationship with Christ. And I, if I preach, I'm going to give a gospel presentation. You need to know who Jesus is. Jesus is the way to life. He humbled himself, even though he was God. He came, lived in the flesh, perfect life, something that I could never do, something that you could never do. He was born of a virgin. He was the only sinless one, therefore he is the only way to salvation. He offered himself as a perfect sacrifice. He bled and he died on the cross. Three days later, he was risen again and won the victory over death and hell and sin. He offers salvation from sins to all of us. He says there are two things that we have to do. We have to have faith in Him. That is true, absolutely. And in order to have that faith, you have to repent. Repentance is something that often gets overlooked. Scripture says that we have to repent and believe. You have to turn from your old way of life. You have to turn from the sinful things in your life and turn towards Christ and follow Him. So if you don't know Christ, I challenge you to do that today. Don't leave without talking to somebody. There are people here I know that would talk to you about a relationship with Christ. But if you do know Christ, you have got to start seeing hardships, persecution as a benefit. And you have got to start standing firm in hardship. Today is the day to start living a rewarding Christian life. Thank you.